That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Amsterdam, the 10th film directed by David O. Russell. That's 10 if you're including the film that he had his name taken off of, Accidental Love, uh, that is being uh, distributed by Disney uh, and 20th Century Studios uh, October 7th, 2022. Do I know a David O. Russell movie? Well, I know I took you to American Hustle. American Hustle. With Jennifer Lawrence? Yes. Okay. So he did a trio of films with Jennifer Lawrence, including The Silver Linings Playbook, for which she won her Oscar for, uh, and in his last movie, Joy, which was already back in 2015. I think he was working on some um, miniseries that got canceled during the height of COVID, I, I want to say. But he's worked with Robert De Niro several times, Christian Bale, this is the third time. Christian Bale, of course, won his Oscar for David O. Russell's The Fighter. Um, I'm a bigger fan of his earlier work, like his debut, Spanking the Monkey. Um, Three Kings has a lot of fans. Flirting with Disasters was, was a very... Uh, you know, 90s uh, kind of rom-com. Uh, but this film aims for the moon and uh, misses a big time. And I think it's most closely comparable to something like I Heart Huckabees, which I think you've seen that too. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, w- I would agree. This was the one of the strangest movie-going experiences I've had in a long time because I really found myself like into the individual characters there are a lot of moments I found humorous in very small bursts. I think the person who directed it wrote it. Yes. I think like the like it's quality writing. But this storytelling is definitely not my cup of tea. And I have I'm, I'm saying it was such a weird experience because I had a lot of positive thoughts about pieces of the movie. But when I tell you I sat in that theater and just could not wait to leave the theater because I was so bored and annoyed not not annoyed but just bored it was so it it's it's very strange because it's, it's incredibly tedious but it, it's it feels like nothing's really happening but then every scene is like chock full of things oh well so then let's move on to the plot because it's so difficult to tell the story because there is so much happening but the way it's arranged the pacing is so weird to the point where i just was like like I wasn't even dozing off as much as just like thinking about anything else but what was happening on the screen. (laughs) Sure. I was paying attention, but yeah. So the basic story, it's set in, uh, we we started like the 1930s. 1933 New York. Oh, it's like so hard to tell the story. Okay, there's this like group called the Five. Uh, The Communion of Five? The Communion of Five. It reminded me of those commercials for Five Gum. (laughs) Because the logo... Okay, there's this organization called The Five, basically. And it has ties to, like, the Nazi party. They're doing... Well, Mussolini. Well, Mussolini. But then one of the characters is, like, sort of already up on Hitler before other people know, like, what he's up to. Yeah, early 30s Hitler was just starting to... Okay, so this group, it's comprised of like business people so they're certainly like into like some sort of supremacy and eugenics because they have like sterilization clinics but they're also business people and we're sort of made to think that their motivation is really about money and power okay so there's that they want to basically get fdr out of office the president And replace him with a general who they think they can use as a puppet. And that general is played by Robert De Niro. Gila Dillenbeck, who's based on a real life person. Yes, he's a retired general who has the ear of like all of the U.S. veterans. So they feel like if they can get him to get the veterans on board, they can do some special election and get FDR out. Mm -hmm. But they have a hard time getting to him. Which, this is where the plot becomes so convoluted to me because Robert De Niro's character was very close friends with another like high-ranking military official played by Ed Begley Jr. And he ends up being killed. Mm -hmm. And his daughter played by Taylor Swift Mm -hmm. hires David John John David Washington Mm -hmm. who's a lawyer to help her figure out who killed her dad. So John David Washington, along with Christian Bale, his best friend, who's a doctor, they are like the stars of the movie. The, so the film starts with Taylor Swift like having them 
like come to an autopsy on her dad. And then she gets freaked out because she realizes like people are watching her. And then Taylor Swift gets killed very quickly. Mm -hmm. We had a pretty funny scene where she gets run over by a truck. She gets pushed underneath the wheels. And then some random people sort of say like, she gets pushed into the traffic because some guy pushes her, but that guy blames Christian Bale and John David Washington. And we find out that guy works for the five Mm -hmm. group. So it was all planned. But they... They're orchestrating this because they're trying to get Robert De Niro to, like, get his ear. So the bulk of the movie, I'm so confused at how it all connects, actually. (laughs) There's so much happening. Christian, Christian Bale and John David Washington spend the beginning of the movie trying to clear their name because there are two police officers saying, like, we're going to, like, arrest you for murder unless you can give us, like, some, like, tangible proof that you had some business with Taylor Swift such that you would not have, like, pushed her into traffic. And they're having a hard time doing that. And then all of a sudden we flash back to 1918 and we learn how Christian Bale, John David Washington met. They met because they were both in the same military troop. This regiment that was created by Ed Begley Jr., uh, which was utilizing black men, uh, but who were forced to wear French uniforms, which is also... A so Ed Begley Jr.'s character is supposed to be like a good guy, and he felt like blacks should be able to serve and serve with respect. So they he like gets some like commander out to then bring in Christian Bale, insisting that he be like a compassionate, respectful person, mm-hmm. which he is. And Christian Bale has a, he's a doctor who has a practice on Park Avenue, but his wife, Andrea Riseborough, her family are anti-Semitic and rich, and so... <sighs> Basically orchestrate him going to war so to hopefully he'll die. See, this is getting complicated. So then in when during the war, Christian Bale and John David Washington get badly injured and the nurse who assists them is played by Margot Robbie. Mm-hmm. And Margot Robbie falls in love with John David Washington and the three of them become like bosom buddies and decide to leave to go to Amsterdam. And then for like like a very good portion of the film is just these three people in Amsterdam living their best lives. Mm -hmm. But then Christian Bale says, I need to go back home because I have a wife, this Park Avenue high society lady. And the way the film makes it seem is like they're gone for a long time, but they're not even gone like a year. Right. Cause they, they get injured in 1915 and then he comes back in 1916. Right. 1918. Oh, so maybe a few years pass. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he's living the life in Amsterdam. (laughs) And he decides to go back to New York to see his wife. Mm -hmm. And that's when everything falls apart because then we go back to Taylor Swift getting run over. He gets put, he has a drug problem because he gets, the family won't let him continue his practice and he gets put in a sanatorium. And so Margot Robbie, who has a very powerful family we don't know yet, goes back to the States to have him released. Margot Robbie's family, her brother, played by... Brahmi Malik, mm-hmm. he's a very rich guy and he's also part of the five. Mm-hmm. But Margot didn't know this obviously because she's a good guy, good person. So then that's another segment of the film with everyone trying to figure out who's in the five. And then we have Mike Myers mm-hmm. and Michael, Michael Shannon. Shannon playing like US and British like secret intelligence people. <laughs> Who are also chasing the five, but they know Margot Robbie. It is there's so much happening. Everything culminates with this New York Veterans Reunion Gala that is being thrown by Christian Bale. And he, along with Margot Robbie and Mike Meyer, Michael Shannon, and Robert De Niro, they come up with a plan to have De Niro speak to the veterans. And then Rami Malik, who I guess owns TV stations or radio stations, he says, We're gonna broadcast this live to the country because he thinks De Niro's gonna like spew propaganda but De Niro gets on the mic and is saying the shit that Ed Begley Jr. was gonna say which got his ass killed because Ed Begley Jr. was killed because he witnessed uh, Mussolini Mussolini run over at trials in Rome and that's what he was going going to report on so then it ends with the secret intelligence people arresting everyone but then we get sort of like towards the end credits like really no one got in trouble because of course rich people will always stay rich and never be in trouble and then this real life plan to instill a fascist uh, dictator in the u.s was foiled and margot robbie and john david washington leave the country because of course in the 1930s this interracial couple can't be in the u.s 
And Christian Bale decides to stay. And we're not even mentioning there's a, a nurse uh, that played by Zoe Saldana that uh, Christian Bale has a dalliance with and Anya Taylor-Joy as Rami Malek's wife. There is so much going on. There's so much. There, <laughs> there are so many people, so many notable people, and almost all of them feel wasted. But they're not, but, but they're doing like, it's fun to see them and they all have their moments for the most part. I feel like Zoe Saldana, well, I mean, she looks fantastic. She does. But I feel like she has nothing to do. Which is funny because they, she, both her and Christian Bale shared the best scene in a 2013 film called Out of the Furnace. Okay, my first note is when we see Christian Bale and Zoe Saldana doing the autopsy on Taylor Swift's dad, uh, my first note is... When were latex gloves invented? Because they are digging into this man with no gloves on. Oh my God. And then when they're done, uh, Zoe takes like her hair down and I'm like, oh, now her hair has like body juice on it. Yeah. And there's a lot of uh, kind of cringe moments because Christian Bale has a glass eye that there's a gag where it pops out sometimes and he has to... There are funny moments, like when, so a big part of the film is the trio, Christian Bale, John David Washington, and Margot Robbie in Amsterdam, and there's a point where they sing something called a nonsense song. Mm -hmm. Oh no, that's actually before they go to Amsterdam, when they're in the hospital recovering from their injuries. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really cute, and that plays a part uh, later on in the film. Um, Then we see Margot Robbie, when she's helping the wounded soldiers, like removing shrapnel and bullets from their bodies, she saves it. Again, not wearing gloves. And she just puts all this bloody metal into like a box. And we find out that she's making art Mm -hmm. out of this like shrapnel. Mm -hmm. I thought that was funny. Turning it, taking her broken (laughs) her broken heart and turning it into art when we meet mike myers and michael shannon they're pretending to be like a glass eye maker because Mm -hmm. mike myers character also has a glass eye Mm -hmm. and then michael shannon's pretending to be like uh something innocuous but really they're spies but when we first meet them they go on and on about being bird watchers yes because there's which was funny codes going on about that because rami malik is also a (laughs) bird watcher and there's this whole theme about the the cuckoo bird because the the five are synonymous with the cuckoo bird which of course is a bird that you know lays a parasitic bird yeah but the, there's a line where they're talking about their birds and they have these taxidermy birds and they're like oh these these two birds are extinct we had the last two of them. Like, <laughs> but the comedy is very much like that. Subtle and dry, which I really like. It's, it's very dry, but... It's just too. It's just spread too far apart to keep the mood going. Well, the tone of each scene seems off. Like, yes. is this a comedy? Is this a drama? Is this an espionage film? It's like the film is never quite sure. Well, because it starts out feeling like, a, like it's going to be like a murder mystery. Like, mm-hmm. clue, uh, what's the movie uh, with uh, Wonder Woman? Oh, Death on the Nile. It kind of felt like, like it was going to... Agatha gonna, Christie? Yeah, it kind of felt like an Agatha Christie thing to for me, a while. To me, this feels very much like if Preston Sturgis, Alfred Hitchcock, and Ernst Lubitsch had gotten together and had a really ugly three-headed baby in the 40s, this is what it would have felt like. Who's the lady uh, with the interesting look? Rami Malek's wife. Anya Taylor-Joy. I really... I think she might have been my favorite part of the movie. She's funny because <laughs> she comes out of there like this young femme fatale from a, like, murder my suite. She's married to Rami Malek, but then Ro- Margot Robbie also lives in the house because it's her brother, but also she's suffering... Her, She's become ill because her brother is poisoning her, we find out. But uh, Anya Taylor-Joy doesn't like Margot Robbie... And it's funny how they interact. Their their interaction is funny. Um, also, Anya has a crush on Robert De Niro's character, which I thought was funny. Because when she says it, we haven't met him yet. Yeah. So like, she's like, oh, this general's so handsome. And I'm thinking like, you know, uh, I'd name a handsome actor, I don't know, is going to pop up on the screen. And then you see Robert De Niro. I know, and she is like, so sprung on him. Uh, they, <laughs> Margot Robbie is designed, like, it's either she's looking like Jack White of the White Stripes or Mata Hari. Yeah. Um, also, the, I think the kind of the mo- the corniest part of the film is really the titular time there in Amsterdam. I'd, to me, that felt very much like um, Cruella with Emma Stone. Oh, sure. Where she's like stuck in this attic and having this romantic yeah. kind of criminal getaway with these two other men. Um, uh, some other funny things. Uh, you already mentioned Christian Bale has a couple moments with his eye that are very subtle. Like he's looking around with the eyes not moving. I thought that was really funny. I thought the two cops who are look who are pursuing, they're not really pursuing Christian and John. Um, 
like they're kind of friendly with them because Christian Bale is a doctor who's providing pain meds to one of the cops who's also... Oh, the cops, Alessandro Nivola and uh, Matthias Schonard. I like them. I thought they were funny. And then the one is kind of... An idiot. But but also the writing's weird because the one is friends with Christian Bale's character. Like they both wear the same kind of back brace and Christian Bale gives him pain meds. They seem friendly. So the cop is giving him a lot, like a long tether to get his shit in order. But I thought a lot of the scenes with... Every scene with the two cops I thought was humorous. And then at one point they're in Christian Bale's office and they see one of the tea sets Margot Robbie made for him from the shrapnel and they call it a degenerate tea set. I thought that entire sequence was fun. Uh, but most of those moments, are the, the only real comedy seems to be in throwaway lines. Like Rami Malek has uh, a line where he tries to give De Niro money right before the speech in... Uh, like this binder in walrus skin. And yeah. he's like, the walrus lived a long life because he, he knew how to do what he was told or something. You're right. And I, and I feel like if you took all of those moments that I really found humorous uh, and you put them together, we'd have like a 20 minute short film. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, Emmanuel Lubezki is the uh, cinematographer who, of course... Uh, it looks very nice. ...with shot many great films for Quaron and uh, Inaratu and probably my favorite work of his is uh, his work on Terrence Malick's Night of Cups. Uh, but I was like, I came out, I, I wrote in my notes like pupils. I see everybody's pupils up close and personal in this film. I don't know yeah. if you noticed that. And they were yes. all very big. Like they all had taken something I wanted to be on. I liked how it looked. Um, the, the three main female uh, characters looked amazing. Oh yeah, Riseboro, uh Robbie and uh, Saldana, yeah. Saldana all looked great. Yeah, um, they look really good. Whoever shot them, the makeup, the hair, it all looks really nice. Um, so then getting back to the tone and the storytelling. So at the point where we find out, because then there's a sequence where Christian Bale's on his own, running around doing whatever, and then Margot Robbie and John David are running around. And then when they reunite, Margot keeps saying like, something really big happened, we need to tell you about it. And then it takes like 20 minutes for it to finally happen. And she even says like, I've been trying to tell you what happened. And then we get the sequence of what she's trying to say. And they came upon one of these sterilization clinics. And then I thought, ooh, the mood changed a lot. Cause you see all these black people in there. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just like, oh, this is uncomfortable. And then we switch to something else that's a little more lighthearted and ridiculous. And then we get to the scene where we see that Rami Malek's character has a portrait of Hitler in his office that he had covered up. So it's like, we're going to dark places and then we just kind of like let it go. Yeah, it, the tone is, is off all over the place. And then sometimes Christian Bale has this narration that's kind of funny because he's taking these drugs and it's his internal monologue of how it's making him feel. And then we didn't even mention we have Chris Rock in there. Oh. And then Chris Rock keeps doing this thing where he's he's basically talking about like don't forget we're black men in the 1930s. Yeah, basically <laughs> like every scene that's Literally, what he's doing. Literally all of his dialogue revolves around that. And it's almost like David O'Russ is like, well, I got to have somebody speaking to like what it's like for black people actually. That's how it felt. It's like he realized like it's David wrote, Russell, it's David Russell being like, I see you. Or he wrote whoever wrote this like wrote all of it and then realized like, oh wait, I have like a black character. We have to address this. We have to do something, so let's get Chris Rock in here, who I think felt out of place because when we flash back to 1918, um, you know, John David Washington looks younger, mm -hmm. and then Chris Rock looks like a man in his 50s mm -hmm. in this military. So that was kind of weird. John, I, I think uh, his character, Harold, was supposed to be Michael B. Jordan originally. So the way all the actors are directed, they're very flat. And I think my impression of John David Washington is that he's very flat. So I guess this was like the perfect role for him. Although even with that, he still felt like the least vibrant of everyone. He felt pretty dead behind yeah. the eyes. Like he was always directed to be like pursing his lips and looking at the camera from the side. And I, I, I don't know. I wanted that thruple to feel like something like bringing a baby. I wanted Margot Robbie to be like Catherine Hepburn, I think. She's likable. Mm, I mean, she's no Catherine Hepburn. Not at but all. I wasn't looking for that. But um, <laughs> Christian Bale, he's doing this accent and he kind of is doing, has body language that reminded me of Al Pacino and Dick Tracy. Sure. So, but it's not bad. I, like, I think he's a very talented actor. I, and, and I did enjoy him. His hair for most of it is like kind of frazzled, mm -hmm. which I thought was funny. Yeah, I did enjoy him as well. Then the scene where the three of them go to see Robert De Niro. Um, yeah, with Beth Grant as his wife. Yeah, uh, that was an interesting scene. I, I think Robert De Niro felt a little stiff, but yeah. when they go to meet him, I wrote down that Ro Margot Robbie's character is dressed like the Baba Duke. Oh, that's where I thought she looked like Jack White. <laughs> oh, well, so I guess Jack White looks like the Baba Duke. 
<laughs> I don't have anything else. Uh, I don't know. It just it it again. I appreciate like ambitious, weird storytelling, but I I have often felt with David O. Russell that it's like he just filmed a bunch of stuff and then. He's edited in a way to make sense for him, but it doesn't really come together that way. I don't know under what circumstance I would have enjoyed this. Because I was saying, even like if I were stuck on an airplane and this were the only movie I could watch, I don't think I would have even mildly enjoyed it in that scenario. Yeah, it's just, it, it, they're very sluggish starts and stops to where you think you might be enjoying it, but I, it really was not good. I'd be very curious to know what people think of this film. What I, would you give it? Two. I would give it two out of five, unfortunately. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button, listen to our podcast. Bye.